Thank you very much. I uh, want to welcome um, our guests uh, here to the Aspen Institute for uh, what I'm sure will be a very interesting dialogue on uh, evaluating the U.S. role in the Levant. We have had the opportunity here at the Aspen Institute to convene uh, a number of these roundtable discussions. Um, and for those of you, please come to the table. Um, Kareem, please. Uh, and others, I'd like you all to come around the table and um, we can fill in uh, accordingly. Uh, but we're joined here today in partnership, uh, the Aspen Institute's Lebanon program, uh, together with the Lebanon Re Renaissance Foundation. We have been conducting a number of roundtable conversation, and today it gives me great pleasure to have a very close friend, Aaron Miller, who Aaron and I work together and continue to work together on a, a number of issues. And Elliot Abrams, who has been a longtime friend uh, and colleague, we go back well to my days on the Hill. Uh, so uh, I look forward to what will be a very interesting conversation here today on events uh, in the Levant. Uh, this is an on the record uh, conversation. I'd like to ask our presenters to um, each of whom to present their views, and then we will um, have uh, what I know will be a robust conversation. So with that, I welcome both of you. And Aaron, I'd like to ask you, if you would, to uh, kick us off. Sure. Um, it's an honor and privilege to be here. I was in Maine, uh, and the temperatures are not much cooler than they are here. I was dismayed when I got off the plane today at BWI. I'm going to do something a little different. Um, I don't. I really don't want to address uh, solutions to the very difficult problems that confront the Obama administration. I, I don't have any solutions, which is inherently, I think, part of um, of what I, I I would like to do today. Um, government is about remedy. Even the Burkeans would have argued that it is about remedy. And I I had the honor and privilege of working for almost 25 years for half a dozen secretaries of state trying to fix things. Now, fixing things is fine. Fixing things requires, um, if you're going to succeed, um, a certain measure of smarts. Uh, you can't let ideology, arrogance, or your own personal preferences interfere with the way the world really is, no matter how much you want it to be different. And um, I... Um, have, have been worried now for almost 20 years uh, about our incapacity to see the world the way it is. Uh, eight years under Bill Clinton and eight years under George W. Bush, I would argue to you that we have been failing in the Levant in matters of peacemaking and in matters of war making. And when great powers do not succeed, and the world's most compelling ideology is not nationalism, it's not capitalism, it's certainly not com communism, and it's not even democracy. The world's most compelling ideology is success, because success generates power, and constituents, and voters, and followers. And failure generates the opposite. And when great powers fail consistently, their street cred becomes undermined. Out of the 100% of the troubles that this administration faces in this region, I would argue 80% of them are not the makings of a year and a half of this president's policies. He may have made his own situation worse in several respects. But he's inherited an investment trap. He can't fix this quickly or easily, and he can't run away from it. And for the great power to be in an investment trap is a terrible position to be. So I want to identify four deficits that I think contribute to this investment trap and which Again, I'm not a declinist, and I don't want anyone here uh, to believe that. I have a profound faith in American power, military and diplomatic, when it's used wisely and appropriately and obviously effectively. And that, that is part of the problem. Because when America acts in matters of peace and war, two questions need to be asked. Can we do this? But a second question has to be asked. What will it cost? And is it worth it? Both questions 
need to be posed to the great power before the great power acts in matters of peacemaking and war, make, war making. So when Bill Clinton says to us on the eve of Camp David that trying and failing is better than not trying at all, that is not as, as determined, brilliant, and well-intentioned as Bill Clinton was on the eve of the Camp David summit 10 years ago this week still, that, that's no substitute for a foreign policy of the greatest and most consequential power on earth. Trying and failing is better than not trying at all. I mean, that's an appropriate slogan for a high school or college football team. It's not a substitute for a foreign policy. So four deficits, in my judgment, make Barack Obama's challenges and conundra in the Levant very, very difficult. Number one is the leadership deficit. From Cairo to Karachi, we are faced with leaders who are prisoners of their politics and not masters of their houses or their political constituencies. They are extractive leaders. They do not wield power with what you could call in, in an American context, uh, context honorable ambition. It's about survival. And in some cases, it's about aggrandizement. But it's not about the capacity or the will to act in pursuit of the common good. This leadership deficit, I would argue, is huge. It's huge because we are asking these leaders, particularly in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, and in the Arab-Israeli arena, and in Lebanon, to take heroic and bold decisions and yet they are not heroes. They are far from heroic. I'm not criticizing them. They do what tiny tribes always do in an effort to maintain their political identity and their physical survival. And the leadership def deficit is huge. In the Arab-Israeli context, not to put too fine a point on it, on one side we have a Palestinian Humpty Dumpty Palestinian national movement 50 years, 60 years after its creation still has not achieved a coherence and an effectiveness in its policy to achieve Palestinian national aspirations. This is a huge problem, huge. On the Israeli side, since the history of peacemaking in Israel has never been about the left, it's all, or, or even the center, it's always about transformed hawks. Everybody who did something bold in the peacemaking context in Israel was a man of the right or center right, whether it's Begin or Rabin, the breaker of bones in the first Palestinian Intifada, or Sharon, the master architect of the settlement movement, who the only man who could have disengaged from Gaza, or Netanyahu in his first incarnation, who said he'll never sit with Arafat, and yet he's the first Israeli prime minister to withdraw from any West Bank territory transformed hawks, but in this case, unlike the others, he's an uncertain and weak hawk. And therein lies part of the leadership problem. Second, we have a legitimacy and, a, and an authority deficit, which in my judgment is really huge, because in two, in two specific cases, Palestine and Lebanon, we have two non-state actors functioning within non-states which are capable of extraordinary power and leverage. Centralized authority in this region is being challenged everywhere. In Iraq to this day, in Afghanistan, in Palestine, in Lebanon, and this notion of the absence of legitimate authority is a huge, huge problem for any would-be Mr. Fixing. The flip side of this is the issue of states who do have centralized authority, and yet we have problems there as well. In Syria, in Egypt, you have an authority and legitimacy problem. Gone are the large men, the Sadats, the Husseins, even the Arafats in his first incarnation, who have the moral authority and the political legitimacy to do big things. Where are they? 
And how can you do big things in this region when politics is existential? Who's going to do a big thing? That's the, that's the second deficit. The third, and I've alluded to it before, is what I call the street cred deficit on our part. And whether we're admired, feared, and respected as much as we need to be in this region is an arguable proposition. I, I don't think we are, frankly. I don't. I mean, my political bias is showing here, forgive me. The last effective foreign policy, in my judgment, we had in this country was at least 16 years ago when Bush 41 and, and Jim Baker, not, it wasn't terribly imaginative. It wasn't that creative. It was a four-year run, but it worked. And for a brief moment, America enjoyed a moment of power and influence, which I think it used relatively adroitly, imperfectly to be sure. Who knows what would have happened if you had a second term? So that street cred deficit, I would argue, hurts the administration. And in this case, I don't think the administration has made its case any stronger by unnecessarily raising expectations. With, with apologies, with contrition, with soaring rhetoric in places like Cairo, and with a policy on the Arab-Israeli issue that to this day I do not fully grasp. Why you would want to get so far out in front rhetorically with no strategy and no capacity to make good on holding, in this case, the government of Israel accountable. And there are areas in which the government of Israel is not held accountable. But talking about it without a strategy to actually do something about it, and by the way, when I say do something, I'm not talking about sanctions or punishment. I'm talking about a strategy which, in, in effect, would involve a fight with Israel, as every would-be peacemaker has always fought with the Israelis. But the outcome of the fight is an advance in a, of American national interests, of Israeli national interests and of Arab and Palestinian interests. So the fight has to be consequential. In this case, the fight came and went. And what? And where are we? Finally, there is an ownership deficit. Now, this is probably too clever by half, but I believe in this. Um, I think that if anything is going to happen of a positive nature in Lebanon, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, these polities, as dysfunctional as they are, need to own their own futures. It was Larry Summers who said that in the history of the world, nobody ever washed a rental car. <laughs> nobody could figure out, at least I couldn't when he said this to me, what, he, what, what was he talking about? And it dawned on me about 30 minutes, I'm not that smart, at 30 minutes after he said this to me, I said, but of course, nobody washes a rental car because you care only about what you own. And unless there is a degree of ownership in this region, accountability, an investment, how, how are we going to do this? How is the great power in a region with a history littered with the remains of other great powers who believe they could impose wrongly, I might add, their will on small tribes, how are we going to fix any of this? This is the hand that this administration has adopted. Now, the problems are long movies. <clears throat> they may well be playing after this particular president leaves office. I do not see quick or easy solutions to any of them. I mean, I wish I could. Iran, diplomacy isn't working. Sanctions will be more effective. But will it deter a state that is motivated by entitlement and insecurity? The worst possible marriage of motivational capacity, entitlement and insecurity. Entitled and insecure states all want nuclear weapons. And guess what? So far, they got them. The North Koreans, the Indians, the Pakistanis, you might even add the Israelis into that mix. What do we do about Iran? Lebanon, imprisoned by its, its geography, where it is, 
sandwiched between the sea and two regional superpowers, will always ensure that mm. their interests are dominant. And by what it is, it's demography. Nations don't change their geography. It's hard to change their demography. Still the absence of a viable political contract between governed and those who govern. With one actor, more than any other, better organized, better motivated, better supplied, essentially in a very comfortable position. I was in Beirut last month. We met with Suleiman, with Hariri, with Berry. They've all made their peace with Syria. That was the first thing they wanted to talk about. And when you sit across mm. the table from Jublat and Hariri, two guys whose fathers were probably murdered at the express or indirect command of Lebanon's neighbor, what, how do you judge these men? How do you judge them? Uh, last point, the Arab-Israeli issue is, and it's counterintuitive, the least hopeless of all of these endeavors. And I will make one prediction. This is where the administration, with or without a strategy, with or without the right policy, with or without the prospects of success, will in fact invest their capital. Because the argument has already been made and the predicate is laid that this issue is so central to American credi credibility, by the way, parens, a highly arguable proposition, close parens, that fixing this is going to fix or even take us a long way toward fixing what ails us in this region. But we have a track record. It's the least hopeless. There are actually some openings. And this is where the administration is going to make its stand, I think, in the hopes of repairing a, a credibility uh, and injecting some hope uh, into an otherwise very grim neighborhood. Uh, why don't I stop there? Aaron, <laughs> I knew I could count on you with, for soaring rhetoric, and I didn't expect you to lift us up. But you did tee up what I knew would be very interesting, uh, what I know will be interesting conversation. So, Elliot, over to you. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Tony, for the invitation. It's true, we we have known each other so long that I've actually known you even longer than I've known Burl Burma. Oh, so uh -oh. we're, going, we're going back a long way. <laughs> uh, I, um, I want to talk about Syria Lebanon mostly and, and get to some of the other issues that Aaron raised uh, in the Q&A because they are all uh, related. Um, and let me start with Syria. Because what we have now is um, eight years of what I would call an unsuccessful Bush policy being followed by, it looks to me like now we'll have four years of an unsuccessful Obama policy. Unsuccessful in the case of Bush, I think, because um, there were an insufficient number of carrots and an insufficient number of sticks to force or induce the government of Syria to change its policy in ways that the United States wanted that policy changed. The, um, the Obama administration tried something different, which was engagement with Syria. The Bush administration had tried it eight years before. Colin Powell went to Syria, Rich Armand went to Syria, Bill Burns went to Syria as Assistant Secretary for the Near East. The, uh, the engagement, which was brief, uh, didn't work. Um, this engagement, which has been going on, I guess you'd say, for a year and a half, has also not worked. Um, it's really never worked. Uh, we've tried to engage Syria before uh, in previous administrations, but if you ask, well, why are we engaging them? We want to change their policy. We want to change their policy toward Hezbollah, or we want to change their policy toward Lebanon, or we want to change their policy toward Iraq or we want to change their internal repression and reduce the, the amount of human rights violations. We've never actually succeeded in doing that. Um, my own theory of it is um, that uh, from the Syrian point of view, from the Assad point of view, 
one has to think of this as a silent movie. That is, visitors come to Damascus. It can be Madeleine Albright, it can be Colin Powell, it can be George Mitchell. It, American, high-ranking Americans come to Damascus. From the Assad point of view, father and son, there is no soundtrack. All that's happening is that the Americans are arriving to uh, show their obeisance to the great powers in Damascus, which is, after all, we have this from the current Assad, really the center of the Arab world, or should be. Um, and all the Americans flock there to, to meet with Assad. What is being said, which we know is uh, a statement of American policy and what we want Syria to do, it's a silent movie. They don't hear it in Damascus. All they do is they see that we keep going. Uh, so they must be doing something right. And if they're doing something right, they do not change their, their policy. And so if you look at 18 months, has this engagement uh, done anything in terms of uh, human rights in Syria, human rights situation in Syria, we have this from Human Rights Watch and many others, is worse now than it was a couple of years ago. Uh, have they stopped arming Hezbollah? Well, judging from the newspapers and the Obama administration, not only have they not stopped, it seems to be getting worse. It may be that they have transferred scuds to Hezbollah for the first time, sometime in the last year or so. Um, why doesn't it work? I think the Assad regime believes that the Obama administration isn't going to change its policy towards Syria. That is, that it has a view, engagement, engagement, engagement. And Syrian misconduct has not really changed that policy over the last 18 months. It doesn't seem like it's on the verge of changing it. I mean, in the middle of all of this, what from the American point of view is Syrian misconduct, the administration announces it will send an ambassador, which, of course, hasn't happened because of Congress. But the lesson, I think, for the Assad regime is um, the administration is not going to change that policy. Um, why is it serious policy to engage in these ways, uh, in these forms of what, again, from the US point of view, is bad conduct? Well, this is a you know, longer conversation. But uh, uh, with respect to the internal situation, it's not all that surprising. Assad is, despite the brief Damascus Spring, has no intention of submitting his government, his allied government, to a, uh, to a free election. Um, he, uh, he's, not, uh, he's not able to project power and influence in the Arab world through wealth because Syria does not have all the oil wells that, for example, the Qataris have. Uh, nor is he able to say, I demand this influence uh, from the point of view of, say, population, the way Egypt could. Uh, what does Syria have? What allows Syria to exercise a certain, in a sense, punch beyond its weight? If I had to choose one word, the word would be violence. That's how Syria throws its weight around by conducting acts of violence itself, and by promoting acts of violence by others. Uh, it's not a new policy, but there's no indication it's going gonna, it's gonna to change. Um, certainly, it is not going to change as a result of persuasion of the verbal variety. That is, we can't send diplomats to Damascus to attempt to persuade Syria that we understand Syria's interests and Assad's interests better than he does. He has a kind of false consciousness about Syrian and Assad family uh, interests. And if you would only listen to us, this is not going to work. My own view is that um, nothing will work unless and until there's a larger change in the region with respect to Iran. Um, in fact, I think until there is uh, either a significant amount of chaos in Iran or someday regime change in Iran. Then, then, then a, a, a self-interested calculation by Assad would say, OK, if the region's changing, then my interest in the region change. Let me just say a word about, about Lebanon, um, which obviously arises in this, in this mix. It is, um, Aaron's quite right. I mean, you, you talk to 
Lebanese leaders like um, Hariri, um, and they have made their peace with Syria, and I am sure that it was painful for them to do so. Um, and they did so, you might say, partly out of patriotism, because uh, they thought they needed to for their country, and partly uh, just because they saw no other alternative at a moment when uh, the United States, France, Saudi Arabia seem to have given up on a forceful defense of Lebanese interests in the face of Syria. Because there was a time a few years ago, it was the, you know, we joked about this, it was the one time, it was the one thing that Chirac and Bush agreed upon and could, could work together on, uh, Lebanon. Uh, and there was a period of pushback against Syrian influence in Lebanon. And you know, if you want, if you want to measure it, what's the thermometer? The thermometer is the speeches of Walid Jumla. <laughs> um, you know, which over the years, you know, go up and down. And I do not, uh, I agree with Aaron, is I don't say this critically. It's very difficult for us sitting here to, to, to criticize people who, for one thing, their own lives are on the line. Uh, the interests of their country and their communities uh, are on the line. Um, I was very critical, I remain very critical of uh, the, the tweet incident in Damascus because what is, you know, I know some people who are in prison in Syria, uh, political prisoners, um, none of whom uh, are violent people. Um, and, you know, you always wonder when an American official visits a city like Damascus, will some hope be given to the political prisoners there and their families? And when the message is we're going to have a cake eating contest, that's a horrible thing. That's just a terrible thing when you think of, of those people and their families. I, um, I wish we could, uh, I wish we would, in conjunction with the French, the Saudis, others, take um, a more vigorous position of support for Lebanese interests and Lebanese sovereignty. Um, but uh, I would have to admit that it wouldn't it's not going to be a black and white change, even if we, if we do that, because here again, I think the, the, fundam the more fundamental question um, is the position of the United States in the region. And that relates more to Iran than it does to uh, Syria and Lebanon. And of course, Syria's relationship with Hezbollah uh, in Lebanon also relates to Syrian-Lebanese relations. Um, and the, excuse me, Syrian-Iranian uh, relations and the, the, um, the future of the regime in Iran. I would end um, only because Aaron ended with a kind of downer. I want to end on a happier note, particularly since all of you came out in 97 degrees. So <laughs> you deserve a piece of optimism. I do not think that there will be a conflict between Israel and Hezbollah this summer. I say that because it seems to me that Hezbollah is the deterrent and second strike capability of Iran. That is why Iran has poured billions and millions of dollars into Hezbollah. Um, given the nuclear uh, situation, given the possibility of an Israeli strike someday, it seems to me that it is very clearly in the interest of the Iranian regime to maintain that deterrent and second strike capability so that they persuade Israel not to do it. I think it would be nuts for Iran to give it up, potentially give it up, in a, in a big Israel-Hezbollah war in the summer of 2010 while the nuclear issue remains unsettled. Now, we know from the kidnapping in 2006, a war can break out unexpectedly. It happened tonight. Um, so we cannot, obviously, rule out the possibility. But it, it seems to me that that uh, it is not in the interest of Iran and Hezbollah to, to have that happen this year. Um, and I therefore expect that it will not. So that's the good news. Well, I'm, thank you both very much. Uh, I'm glad to uh, hear you ended with some good news. But I think I'm going to respectfully have to challenge that assumption. Please. And I'd like to 
take the prerogative of the chair and put on the table as we are in the summer of escalating uh, temperature. I'm looking at the rhetoric coming out of the region with some concern, and uh, I see it escalating. Uh, you are both correct in saying Hariri, uh, Prime Minister Hariri has just recently concluded a fourth visit to, uh, to Syria, and I'm looking down the horizon, and I want to ask uh, both of you to comment on that horizon. And uh, September uh, holds, if we can get through uh, the month of August, a lot uh, is on the table in September, both in the context of Arab-Israeli issues and uh, hopefully going into September uh, an announcement of direct talks, which would help calm things down. History is proven when there is traction on the peace process, those who are opposed to it tend to stir the pot, whether that may be in Gaza or in Lebanon. Secondly, as you look at Lebanon, you've got um, the conclusion of the Hariri investigation and the tribunal, uh, the um, conclusion coming out of the tribunal, and how that will resonate in the region is of great concern. Thirdly, on Iran, um, as I was preparing for this uh, roundtable discussion today, there's a report that came out from our um, colleagues down the street, Brookings, and frankly, it took me aback. And I want both of you to comment, and I'm sure like to hear others in the room. And one of the recommendations was, as it relates to Lebanon, that Washington should implement a policy that uh, includes Hezbollah, that no U.S. policy in Lebanon can, can succeed without an effective containment strategy for Hezbollah. Well, um, I'm not, first of all, I don't like the word containment. I don't think we've handled containment vis-a-vis -vis Iran exceptionally well when we were doing it in the early days or, or where we are now. Um, we're obviously moving much more aggressively uh, with regard to a sanctions policy and, and where that goes. But is the suggestion on the table that flows from this report that we need to embrace an overt role uh, for Hezbollah in a Lebanon government? and as as U.S. policy. And so I'd like to hear you both comment on uh, where you see this nexus. And Aaron, do you agree with uh, Elliot on uh, the potential or lack of potential for a conflict in the region? And how do you see Iran in the context of resumption of what may be resumption of direct talks? You know, I, when I was in Beirut, I gave a talk, a public talk at AUB, and I pointed out to them um, even though the analysis was very grim. I, I argued there was a perfect storm gathering composed of three factors, and Lebanon would suffer from each one. The first was the tribunal, if it went the wrong way. Um, the second was, paradoxically, the reactivation of the peace process, which would elicit from both Hezbollah, the Syrians, should they be excluded, and should that process become serious, the farther you go, the more serious it becomes, the greater the reaction against. And that would include the Iranians. That was the second element of the perfect storm. And the third was Israel was concerned about, Israeli concerns about uh, the redundancy and, and perhaps the qualitative and quantitative escalation of the Hezbollah arsenal. But all of these things, and the emblematic of the, the reports of the Scuds, were they delivered? Were they, are they, uh, has Balai training on them in Syria? Is that the problem? And haven't they yet crossed the border? I mean, I, I never understood any of this. Um, um, so those three factors were combining to make it a, the, the, have a potential of a very hot summer. And yet I concluded by, easy for me to say, I was getting <laughs> on an airplane, ready to come back, that this would not be a hot summer. It would not be a hot summer. Because the Israelis all caught up in their, is the Obama administration pandering toward us or punishing us? We don't have an answer to that, and we're not going to pile on by um, triggering a war until we're much more certain about where we stand. But doesn't that suggest Israel controls the destiny? I'm not so well, sure of that well, underlying presumption. Well, they're usually, uh, Middle East wars don't happen by accident. There are triggers, there are escalatory cycles and periods of buildup. And rhetoric notwithstanding, I don't think <coughs> neither Nasrallah nor 
the Israeli Prime Minister has a stake in rocking the boat. Now, what is the boat? The boat is, well, the 06 war was managed very badly. The IDF isn't supposed to tie. And on this one, in the record of Israeli wars, you could even argue they lost. And yet, the power of deterrence, high trajectory fire from Lebanon into Israel, both from Lebanon and from Gaza, is more or less stopped. So why, if I'm in Israel, why do I want to rock the boat? And Nasrallah has to be arguing to himself late, late at night or if he's shaving in the morning. You know, we were really, really lucky in a way. And I don't want to push that. I am now an icon still. I mean, Erdogan is now trying to edge me out. But I am still, my street cred is really high. And I'm not, I don't want to risk that now. And Elliot may be right that, that um, Hezbollah is really the Iranian bench in the event of an Israeli strike. So what, it's July, the end of July? I guess if you were making predictions, per, per, perhaps even for the reasons you say, that there's <coughs> usually an anticipation in the rhythmic cycles of Washington. Quiet summer, Nin 1990 was an exception. Things will wait. Everybody will wait, and against the backdrop of the UN General Assembly and September when the clocks start ticking again, in this case proximity, the proximity talks clock, the settlement moratorium clock, they'll wait. So if I had a, if I had a bet, it won't be a uh, hot summer. Ellie, how about I on just, Iran? Uh, I wanted to comment on uh, Hezbollah. Yeah. Um, I think it would be a significant mistake to engage Hezbollah now. Um, there are many arguments against it, but let me just give one. There was a very interesting study done called Talking to Terrorists uh, by two people at Cambridge University, um, Bew and Frampton, if I remember their names right. Um, and they looked primarily at the IRA, uh, though they also looked at, at Hamas and a few other cases. And their conclusion was uh, essentially, that if you talk to terrorists when they are in good shape, they believe that it is an act of weakness on your part and that they are winning and that therefore they should do more of the same. You're talking to them, but they're terrorists, so they should do more terrorism. They um, have an elaborate argument about the cases in which the uh, British government talked to the IRA and it produced disaster and violence. And then the cases where they talked to the IRA and it didn't. Well, what changed? One thing that changed was that the IRA, which had significant support outside of Ireland, in, in London, in Dublin, in Washington, in Boston at the time, the IRA at a certain point became completely isolated. It had no support. It had no support in the world. All of that support, including the money that had been coming in from the US, is cut off. And there's no support in Dublin. And the British then, through a very forceful effort, essentially defeat the IRA. And that's when talking to the IRA, according to Bew and Frampton, actually helped get to a solution. When they were defeated, when they were isolated. Hezbollah is not defeated and it is not isolated. And talking to them at this point would only persuade them uh, that they're winning. Elliot, I'd like to suggest I was very involved in uh, the Northern Ireland, Ireland issue at that time, and one of the issues was twofold. It was the political courage of what was called the Gang of Four on Capitol Hill that led the effort to isolate NORAID and to call it for what it was in terms of supporting a uh, what was then a terrorist organization. Secondly, it was a very robust effort to create alternatives to provide jobs and a social infrastructure that was created, uh, uh, that created a whole new dynamic in the North, that mm -hmm. it was the two combined. Uh, and that's part of our problem uh, in terms of uh, Hezbollah's role yeah. and Hamas's role in Gaza, and I think we need to put that, Can I be very mindful of One additional point, a political point. The discretion that American presidents have to deal with bad guys um, is broadened. The latitude is broadened when Americans are in harm's way, which is why you could make the argument, not to make the argument, we are engaging. 
both with Sunni insurgents and we will be engaging with elements of Taliban in Afghanistan. And the reason that that is okay politically is because Americans are on the ground. Hamas and Hezbollah, let's be clear, represent <coughs> part of the problem Part of it is the key to empty room. Without a strategy, an overall strategy has to use the dialogue. Why would you want to? What's the point? Because what's going to happen is you're going to end up stirring up all kinds of trouble without sufficient cause, a reason, or an end game. You can't explain it. People need explanations. Presidents need explanations in order to justify what it is they do. So, yes. With the awakening and with Taliban in Afghanistan, we can justify talking to people who have been responsible for the deaths of American um, military and innocents, probably Americans as well, who aren't soldiers. In the case of Hamas and Hezbollah, you buy yourself nothing but headaches, big headaches. Let's, I'd like to open the conversation now to everyone else. Uh, so if you would please uh, uh, recognize yourself, uh, introduce yourself. Thank you. I'm uh, Hussein Abdul Hussein with Chatham House. And um, I'm just surprised to hear uh, Mr. Miller talk about the tribunal. You put it on an equal footing with Hezbollah actually amassing missiles in Lebanon. You, you called it a storm. You said that Mr. Jumblad and Mr. Hariri went to Damascus even though their fathers were killed. Now, uh, we know these were their fathers, but uh, Mr. Hari was a prime minister. And I think justice belongs to the, to the whole people. And maybe for a strategy, we, th we should think of justice, because if it's not served in the case of Mr. Hariri, if we compromise on the, on the tribunal, I think this is a clear message to whoever from the Sunnis of Lebanon who have not endorsed violence yet, to endorse it now. Because if justice does not serve, is not served for the Sunnis, then maybe that's an incentive for them to pick up arms and start, start fighting the Shia. I think, I think that would be a good strategy to, to highlight justice. Because as I understood from the way you put it, tribunal is a storm, is an obstacle. We should compromise over it. And, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Well, no, you're going you know, to forget more about this subject than I'm ever going to know. My intention is not to, to, to um, reach any of those questions. None of them. I, I, I don't have a view, actually. I haven't thought it through. I'm not suggesting at all that we participate in a miscarriage or an, uh, an aborted tribunal and press whomever we would press not to, not to follow the evidentiary trail. I'm not suggesting that at all. All I'm suggesting is it, is, it will be one source of tension. Alec, did you want to come? Uh, Karim? Um, first, uh, fantastic presentations. Karim Sajipur from uh, Carnegie Endowment. Um, two <laughs> terrific presentations. I wanted to um, press Elliot a little bit on uh, U.S. policy towards Syria during the Bush administration, because you said that it was a policy of insufficient carrots and insufficient sticks. And Syria seems to me a classic example of a country ruled by a cartel, which often doesn't, which often acts at loggerheads with its own, with the Syrian national interests, mm. acts in, in cartel interests. So, you know, an example of a carrot which is oftentimes thrown out, not just towards Syria but also Iran, is World Trade organiza uh, Organization accession. And if you're a cartel, if you're a mafia. You don't want to join the World Trade Organization and have to go through all the hoops that makes your economy more um, transparent and, 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 and modern, et cetera. So what would be the examples of carrots and sticks that you think the Assad government would, would, would welcome? Uh, we thought that, uh, particularly at the beginning, that Assad wanted to modernize the economy. Um, it was clear that that the uh, oil they had was diminishing. They never had much anyway. Um, there were rumors he was a kind of modernizer. So the, the thought was, you know, uh, what if you could eliminate the sanctions? What if you could have uh, a decent trading relationship? It was essentially the removal of sanctions. And that was inadequate. 
Uh, I mean, you certainly couldn't, you know, you couldn't do foreign aid or something like that to Syria, no matter what, in, in any in any realistic uh, picture of the Assad regime. You could have, I think, eliminated sanctions had Syrian behavior changed. But what does that really do for the Syrians? If you look at the sanctions, they weren't exactly destroying the regime anyway. Uh, we had the um, Syria Accountability Act with its list of sanctions. You know, we weren't selling um, aircraft. Um, there wasn't very much trade. Maybe you could say the sanctions had succeeded previously because by the time we got to the point of where we could say to the Syrians, you know, someday they might be eliminated, there just wasn't much trade there. And uh, I would say the proof is in the pudding. I mean, it really, the Syrians didn't much react to these offers which Secretary Powell and others made. The basic, the basic line, Powell said, look, you, you have to choose your relationship with the United States. It's up to you. We would be perfectly happy to have a different relationship. Um, so uh, the carrot, I guess I'd say, was, was the elimination of sanctions, and it just it didn't mean much. And I think your point is exactly right. That is, it might have meant something for an unemployed Syrian, but for, for the, the very small group, you know, these are people that are people who, for example, get told by Assad, you do the cellular telephone uh, contract, so you make a billion dollars. Well, they're not just even lifting sanctions. What do they care? Exactly. I, I, the, the point I guess I make is that I think uh, oftentimes um, what appear to us carrots are, are sticks for these uh, regimes and, and vice versa. In the case of the WTO, I think that's right. They were not, as, as is true of any non competitive setup. Um, <clears throat> so we just, uh, we couldn't provide them with a picture of a relationship that made sense to the rulers of Syria as one that was going to uh, significantly advance their, their interests. But Elliot, I think just to comment on that, um, the one who was intimately involved in that whole economic architecture in the context of the Israel-Syria talks, it, it, the, the carrot for them was the whole, the whole picture. It was the what could come to pass in the context of a of an Israel Syria agreement and an Israel Lebanon agreement, and how they would then, in their minds, assume their rightful place in the world in terms of globalization, in terms of um, and how we would nurture them in, uh, on the WTO, and and the openings would have been far and wide. Well, let me and so let me. That's what yes. they were coming well, off of, I that, think that's, in their mindset. I think that's right in the sense that, that, let me restate, what we were offering, we, the United States government, was this economic stuff that was inadequate. What Syria was thinking about, or let's say, what the regime was thinking about was <clears throat> two things they wanted and we didn't have to offer. One of them was the Golan, <coughs> which was not ours to offer. The other was Lebanon, which, which is something that Syria had, lost, wants back, I think, and of course we, we're hardly in a position, I mean, we were in a position, I guess, we, we were adamantly opposed to the idea that you would make a deal with, exactly. with Syria and give them back Lebanon. In fact, I think you would make an argument that Lebanon was and remains a far greater interest of Assad than the Golan. Why? Because the Golan isn't money and Lebanon's money. I think that uh, that's the conventional thinking I would question, though, um, in today's world and given the openings that Syria now has in the Gulf and trading. Their economic reliance can help minimize their political interest if it's played right. And that's the question, the creativity of helping to create a different environment and construct, I would suggest. Um, Mark Ginsburg. Thank you, uh, Mark Ginsburg. Uh, very delighted to be with my two good friends here, and I'm going to challenge them to answer two questions that gnaw at me morning, noon, and night. Uh, Elliot, a year, two years from now, the U.S. is out of Iraq, uh, more or less. What does what is the consideration inside Damascus as to how that plays on its regional 
views of itself and its own ambitions vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the region. The second question to my good friend Aaron. Aaron, if someone who had nothing else better to do than to look at the thermometer at Brookings and decided that we should talk to Hezbollah because it may get them a uh, mention here today, uh, is, there a con is there someone in the region trying to connect the dots between Hez talking to Hezbollah and talking to Hamas? And is there any connectivity between, and what is the connectivity between Hezbollah and Hamas insofar as any goals and objectives that we may have in the region? Does talking to one necessarily have anything to do with talking to the other? Aaron, do you want to start? That's a good question, Mark. I mean, it's a complicated question. Um, obviously, the two major sources of instability in the Levant before you go further afield to the prospects of you know, an Israeli-Iranian confrontation, or even an American-Iranian confrontation, are these two non-state actors functioning in two non-states, both which border the Middle East's most preeminent military power. It's already demonstrated its intention to act in 06 and in 08 against both of these actors. So the real question is, could you divine a strategy that would fix that problem? And what would it take? And that gets to the whole question of what do these groups, these movements, really want? Are they status quo powers which are now shackled with the realities of governance, more accountable than they were a decade ago? Or, are, or to what degree are they revolutionary? In, or are they conservative revolutionaries who want to use the realities of power in order to transform their respective non-states in ways that give them much more leverage? It's the long game. They're both playing the long game. And I, don't, I'm, I just don't know. I don't think we know. And, and you know so? They may not know what exactly their strategy is. So unlike the PLO or Mahmoud Abbas, whose success and failure is measured in very conventional terms, and he's failing in terms of the re stuff that's really important to Palestinians, the end of the occupation and dignity in a Palestinian state and all the rest, what are the benchmarks for them that constitute success and failure? It really gets to the, and that's why these, I think that's why the situation is so tricky and why these um, actors present such a challenge to us. I wouldn't be against engaging either of them if you had a strategy and a strategy that was acquiesced in both by the Lebanese and by the Israelis. But I don't think we're smart enough to do that and I don't think the situation right now is we know enough, and I'm not sure it, well, right now, that kind of policy would only fail and make this president look weaker in this region than he already appears. Just as a quick follow-up, Aaron, do, do they talk, do you have any reason to know how much they coordinate their geopolitical military relations with each other? No, I mean, I, I mean, you know, that's an intel question better asked of your, you know, former colleagues and mine who have <laughs> access to all kinds of information through all kinds of means and are probably in a position to, you know, produce a pretty intelligent assessment of what kind of context on what issues these two groups actually do have. I suspect there, there's a lot more than we would suspect. Um, your other question, um, also very interesting and difficult to answer. <clears throat> the, um, I don't think we know yet what Syrian policy toward Iraq is going to be because Syrian policy uh, since the U.S. invasion has been a policy toward the United States more than it has toward the country called Iraq. Their policy was to have as many Americans as possible die in Iraq and to have as much bloodshed as possible, to have as many Iraqis die as possible and keep the place 
just bathed in blood. That was Syrian policy. Well, that period is over. <clears throat> now you've got, um, you're getting an American withdrawal and, and uh, an independent country, which they're going to be viewing as a rival, no doubt. Um, they're undoubtedly annoyed <laughs> by, the, uh, by the reconstruction of the uh, Iraqi economy that's coming because the oil money is going to be flowing as production increases steadily, and it is. Um, and of course, their policy will be affected by uh, Syrian, the Kurdish problem in Syria, which is handled in Syria by intense repression, period, solely by intense repression. Um, there isn't even a feint toward uh, a better treatment of the Kurds. Um, so what will it be? You know, um, there have been very tough moments. This goes back in the last year and a half, let's say, in the Obama administration when the U.S. is clearly getting out of Iraq and Syria is still mucking around in Iraq. And you've had a withdrawal, for example, of the, Syrian ambassador, of the Iraqi ambassador to Syria. Very interesting. Um, I would think we're going to have a low but steady level of tension between Syria and Iraq, partly because I think the Iraqis resent what Syria has been doing to their country. It is a fact that during the Iraq war, jihadis who wanted to go into Iraq did not go across the Saudi border or the Kuwaiti border or the Jordanian border or the Turkish border. They flew to Damascus International Airport and were then assisted across the border. That's how jihadis went to Iraq. Iraqis know this and know exactly what was, what was going on. So I think it'll be a while before those relations actually uh, become smooth. And what, you know, how Assad is going to see this and, and, and try to deal with a, a fully independent, sovereign Iraq with no Americans there, uh, I don't think we have any, any uh, real telltales yet. Firaz. Firaz Makassad of the Lebanon Renaissance Foundation. I want to thank both of you for being with us today. Um, Elliot, that, it was a very effective analogy you had about that silent movie. It also reminded me that if this was a movie that we saw throughout the 90s. <laughs> it's an old silent movie. Re replaying again. <laughs> but you concluded by, by saying that Assad may very well not change his mind until we've dealt with Iran. And so it was a clearer picture of where we're going with Iran. So we and, and that seems to me to reflect the current reality in, in this town, which is the bandwidth that the administration has for the Middle East, the places where we do not have troops, seem to be taken up by two primary issues. One being Iran, second being the peace process. And perhaps it's the bandwidth, perhaps there isn't the time to find to put together a coherent Syria policy or a coherent, coherent Lebanon policy. And I think symptomatic of that is when the issue of what happens come September to deal with the tribunal, for example, mm -hmm. should Hezbollah again take over better. We haven't really brushed that out yet. We haven't. Um, what would be your best guess as to what our Syria policy is or, or, or what it should be is, is my question to you. My question, question to Aaron, I'd like you to weigh in on this, is um, the notion of trying to peel Syria away from Iran that has repeatedly come up in this now. Um, it's tough to say whether there are folks in this administration who still subscribe to that. Um, Imad Mustafa, the Syrian ambassador, um, Bashar Assad in his interview with Charlie Rhodes have repeatedly said that absent a peace process, absent the return of the Golan Heights, their only strategic interest in Lebanon, and I know we've had the discussion about economic interest in Lebanon, is supporting what they call the National Lebanese Resistance, because Hezbollah is the first line of defense for Damascus, and it's a tool it uses to pressure Israel to the Golan Heights. So in light of that, what is the, the prospect of trying to field Syria away from Iran? <coughs> Alex, you want to begin? Well, <clears throat> uh, what should our policy towards Syria be? Um, first, I think the, um, there is a constraint here, which is, in my view, that <clears throat> you know Assad is looking at the Middle East, he's looking at Iraq, he's looking at Iran, Israel. So it isn't as if U.S. policy towards Syria will determine exactly what Assad does. There's more than just U.S. policy towards Syria there. Primarily, there's Iran, in my view. 
Um, but I think we should have a much tougher policy. For example, we should have a much tougher rhetorical policy. I think it is absurd. In fact, it's not absurd. It's immoral to be sending high-tech executives over to Syria and doing nothing about Syrian political prisoners, which is essentially what we're doing. I mean, yeah, you can go find a statement from the State Department spokesman from a month ago or something. I mean real pressure on Syria for human rights. We should be denouncing. We joined the Human Rights Commission, which I thought was a mistake. Okay, let's use it. We should be denouncing Syria weekly for its despicable human rights practices. How about the third committee in New York? I mean, there's much more that we could do to bring pressure on Syria. Um, for human rights abuses, which I think would be a very useful thing to do for the people of Syria. I think we should not, I think we should stop the engagement gig because it's failed. We, the, the president, I, I don't, I think everybody here would agree that the president did this in good faith. This wasn't a trick by President Obama with respect to Syria. He wanted this to work. He meant it. And if the Syrians had responded, he would then have approached questions like the end of sanctions or improved relationship. Senator Kerry has gone over time after time with no result whatsoever except, except, in my view, to humiliate the United States because we look to be suckers. So I would just stop it and say, we have an answer from Syria. Syria wishes to have a hostile relationship with the United States and to act in opposition to US interests in every way it can. Okay, guys. You've defined the relationship. Take the consequences. Aaron? Um, one, let me start this way. <clears throat> I think good, good friendships, marriages, business propositions last, however dysfunctional they may be, because they continue to serve the interests and the needs of both sides. Okay. This relationship between Syria and Iran is really quite remarkable. What may hold it together more than anything else is its non-ideological component. No relationship between any two Arab states has ever endured with the kind of constancy and commitment that this one has, in large part because the Arabs were ideological competitors. That's not what happens here in this relationship. Ideology, I think, the fact that you've got a uh, an Iranian and an Arab Alawi regime serves as an adhesive to bind the two together. And what is really driving this relationship is purposeful function and interest. And it, it actually does work. So you'd have to see some fundamental change in the reality after 30 plus years in order to even begin setting the stage for the, the peel away philosophy. I mean, I, 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 you know, with all due respect to my predest, my, well, my colleagues in government, I, I mean, I must have written in the space of 25 years, maybe 30 memos about how to leverage Syria. And that, I would put that in how to peel Syria and Iran away from one another, I guarantee you, no, no less than 50 memoranda to serious people have been, have been fabricated and composed on this subject. And it, we could never leverage Syria because we didn't have the tools and we didn't understand the reality. The closest thing you, you, I could say is to use the example of Assad the Elder. It took the collapse of the former Soviet Union and Assad's notion that Gorbachev was a reformer and reformers were dangerous and the Soviet-Syrian connection was in jeopardy combined with a huge event. Saddam's idiosyncratic, for an Arab leader, idiosyncratic decision to invade Kuwait and actually try to gobble it up and the American response to persuade Assad that there had to be a fundamental change, or at least a test, because that's what he did, a fundamental change, plus one other thing, an administration that wasn't, that would, that put <coughs> self-interest and reality over ideology to want to embrace Assad. 
So I think in order to, to recreate a different kind of relationship and, and peel these two from one another, you're going to need big events and an administration that is prepared to actually offer something. I mean, Baker, Baker basically told Assad that well in advance of any consultations with Congress, and what got Assad involved in this is that Baker said, we will put American forces on the Golan. We will have a new relationship with you. Forget you're dealing with the Israelis. We'll, we will have a different relationship with you, and Assad never heard this. And combined with the retreat of the Russians and the realities of American power at the time, it seemed to Assad that was not a bad proposition to test. You'd need a similar set of circumstances to have this thing come unglued. Well, um, I feel compelled to uh, intervene. Uh, my <laughs> colleagues have put uh, uh, some issues on the table, and um, I think, that first of all, um, I'm not going to be uh, to, to try to make a case for our colleagues in government and the Obama administration, but I think we're painting uh, too bleak of a picture. We have a president who uh, may have uh, raised rhetoric uh, a little uh, higher than we would have liked, but he is uh, committed and his administration is committed. Uh, and they're, I think they're committed on a number of fronts uh, that are valid and important. We're seeing them move on Iran. Uh, sanctions uh, are, uh, have been, you know, we have enhanced sanctions regime that have been agreed to by the UN. They are being implemented. We, are, we have yet to see how it's going to play out. We've got to watch Act Two. With regard to Syria, um, I think that it is important to, to note a couple of things. Number one, uh, I do believe in engagement. I feel very strongly that we need to make our case directly. I also feel equally strongly about making the case about human rights abuses and uh, anything else that needs to be on the table. We did it before. I have every reason to believe that this administration is doing it. Now, whether they're doing it as publicly as we would like, uh, that's another question. Uh, on the issue of uh, the Golan, we were talking in this room as though there's not another party. May I remind you, Israel was engaged in track two diplomacy uh, that by all accounts had made progress with the Turks. Now that fell apart. They can put the concept of re-engaging in what is the rhetoric that we all know is a comprehensive peace engaging Israel and Syria in direct negotiations. There is nothing that is precluding that. And I think that, uh, you know, that does, there's no, um, Aaron and I have had this inherent tension and struggle in terms of can Israel, is there the bandwidth to do an Israeli-Palestinian track and an Israeli-Syria track that leads to an Israel-Lebanon, uh, i.e. a comprehensive peace. I am here to argue there is. I also think this concept that we have this, con this notion of time and that time is that we can just continue to muddle along. We cannot. This region is going, we've got issues in Egypt. We are all keenly aware of the succession issues that loom large. Saudi Arabia is, you have to look at the, the, the issues of, of future succession. Is it short term, mid term? You have um, the, we at Aspen hosted the ambassador from the United Arab Emirates in what was a very robust conversation on what is the existential threat of Iran. And that threat, as he said so well, it was not without coincidence that the Bashir reactor is closer to Abu Dhabi than it is to Iran. Are we missing opportunities here to advance an agenda? I happen to think our colleagues, whether we you know, uh, I think these dialogues are here to put new ideas on the table. And uh, they may be doing, uh, could be doing more, um, but uh, I think that, that we have to be mindful that we don't have this, this notion of time. 
and we've talked about a clock. The clock is not just September. I think our clock is a much shorter horizon than any of us, frankly, are prepared to accept. And I don't know if there's agreement by my two colleagues, and if you'd like to comment, but, um, and I do not think that we are, there may be frustration in the region at the end of the day, it is America that can still move this agenda forward, and I'm here to suggest that we are engaging and need to, to engage uh, in as creative way uh, and as with a robust toolbox as possible. Yeah, I mean, I, again, I'm not a declinist. I'm not here to argue that that American power, when it's wisely used uh, in situations where there's a chance of success, isn't warranted or even mandated. But I don't. You'd have to really paint a much more compelling picture of the opportunities available. Governing is about choosing. I, I learned that, okay? I learned that. Governing is about choosing. I think FDR said Lincoln died a very sad man because Lincoln could not have everything. Well, Obama can't have everything either. He's a wartime president with a Nobel Peace Prize. He's involved in two wars where victory is measured not by can we win, but when can we leave. He's tried ably ably orchestrating sanctions, and yet the centrifuges are still continuing to spin. He did raise rhetoric on the Arab-Israeli issue, and I said to you, I think that's the least hopeless of all the issues that I see, and I believe he will make a significant, serious effort. But let's be clear and not replicate what we went through in that fateful summer of 2000, where, in fact, we listened to the bold but reckless policy of an Israeli prime minister who is going to solve the Arab-Israeli conflict with both Syria and the Palestinians before the end of Bill Clinton's term. And you know what happened? We didn't get any agreements. None. Thank you for the reminder, Aaron. Yes. <laughs> and, and, we were, and, we were all, and we were all, in our own ways, complicit, some of us more than others, in that debacle. So the cautionary tale here, I think, is this guy, this president, I mean, he, you know, 16 American presidents got two terms, 12 or 13 served him out. This guy can, in fact, get a second term. But I'm not entirely persuaded, other than Afghanistan, that his political fortunes right now depend, other than taking a turn for the worse, on that, this angry, broken, dysfunctional region, oh, which, which it, it is, which it is, and I'm not entirely persuaded he doesn't understand that. You got two clocks ticking. You pointed them out: moratorium, settlements clock, and you've got the proximity. You got another clock ticking, and it's it runs out after the two of those. It's the November clock, yeah. and that clock which is Obama's political clock, has to be reconciled on the Arab-Israeli issue with these other two. So patience. In Obama's worldview, Tony, it may, it may be that 2011 is, in fact, the year to make a run at this, not this fall. Are there, are, I, I just want to, um, I'm going to go a lot. Uh, it is, of course, a historical fact that Omer Started these talks uh, with, the, uh, with the Syrians via Turkey, um, and it's obvious what <coughs> the Syrians wanted in those talks. <coughs> or the Golan. What did the Israelis it's very want? Obvious. What did the Israelis want? What was the Israeli precondition for giving Syria the Golan? It was a total and complete break in the relationship that Syria now has with Iran and Hezbollah. So I go back to what I was saying before. If you're Assad and you look at a rising Iran, you're not going to do that. If you look at a collapsing Iran, different calculation. Breaking with an Iran that's falling apart, breaking with an Iran that has, through the use of military force, been deprived of its nuclear program. Breaking with an Iran that has a new post-theocratic uh, IRGC government is a different story. So in my view, they can negotiate all they want. There will be no deal on the Golan unless and until the government of Iran changes. 
Well, I guess the question on the table is how do you get there and how do you... I Other than through the U.S. Air Force. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm ever mindful of November, Elliot, and I'm not about to give you that one. Uh, are there... Yes, Mike Craft? Yeah, uh, hi. Great discussion, including hearing Tony talk on other things besides legislation, since we go back so far. Um, I want to take up something Elliot said and make a slight correction to uh, Aaron. Um, when you, you mentioned this Cambridge book on negotiations. Yeah. Uh, last week I heard Professor Audrey Conan of uh, War College uh, <coughs> give a talk at the uh, U.S. Institute for Peace on a paper she wrote in which she said that uh, it's uh, when, when terrorist groups think they're, they're uh, losing support, that's when they're most likely to negotiate. And I su suggest this could apply to uh, countries also. And this gets to the question of whether there's anything really to negotiate with uh, Syria. You raised an, raise an interesting question about Hezbollah being sort of the second strike for um, I uh, Iran in case of a conflict. I, I think you're right on that. And where I disagree slightly with Aaron is there's also the possibility and the concern, at least in counterterrorism circles, that Hezbollah would strike in the United States. They've, 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 strong, they've uh, hit Argentina and they have a long reach and they have a history of attacking, taking Americans hostage. On the other hand, there's, this works two ways. They, Hezbollah now has an address in, in southern Lebanon and I don't know if any of you think that Americans would stand by if we were hit by Hezbollah in retaliation. Would, if Americans would stand by without either letting the Israelis have a pretty free hand to hit Hezbollah. Well, I'm suggesting there may be a bit of a, st a standoff there. But does anybody think that either um, Hezbollah, Hamas, or Syria think they're losing support generally? I mean, I just don't see any, any uh, value in negotiations at this time with them when they seem to think they're on the high road. I agree with you fully. I think... <clears throat> um, there is some indication that Hezbollah, excuse me, that Hamas is not so popular anymore in Gaza because they rule with quite a heavy hand. But they have this gigantic assistance from Iran, uh, which is interesting. You know, if you think five years ago, as little as five years ago, it was a big debate. Uh, people said, you know, Hamas is getting help from Iran, and many people said, impossible. Sony Shia, this cannot be happening. Well, this is the main support for Hamas. There's also the flotilla issue. Yeah, so I, I agree with you. I, I think that, that um, you know, we go back to Iran as the critical question and American-Iranian relations and the longevity of the regime and the nature of its policies and the sense on the part of Israelis, Arabs, uh, Hezbollah, that they are on a steady rise in power in, and influence in the region or not. Ash? Yeah, um, Ash Jane uh, with, the with the Washington Institute uh, for Near East Policy. Um, I'd also like to ask a question about uh, coming back to Lebanon and Hezbollah. Um, regarding Hezbollah's participation in this national unity government uh, that it's had now for a couple of years, um, unlike Hamas, where the United States has been clear with regard to a set of principles, the, the quartet principles for um, you know, its uh, participation in some kind of reconcilia uh, reconciliation government, We've, the United States has largely stood by passively when it comes to the question of should Hezbollah be, you know, involved in, uh, you know, in, in a government that brings together all of the factions in Lebanon. I, I would like, like to get your views, um, particularly uh, Elliot's views since, um, I guess, the initial decision in, in the Doha agreement in 2008 um, happened under the, wa the watch of the Bush administration um, as to whether it was a good idea to stand by and let Hezbollah assume its role, or, or what other options would there be to change that? Well, I don't know that there were any good options. I mean, they had been participating less uh, directly in the government. I mean, in the years that we were most involved, say 2006, 2007, um, after the war, um, when we would go to Beirut, who would meet with uh, the foreign minister, Fnish, who was a Shia and was put in the cabinet by Hezbollah. Um, so we were acquiescing in what we viewed as the reality in Lebanon. Um, there was a question as to whether you could permit, should permit Hamas to run in the 2006 uh, Palestinian elections. 
question really didn't arise. I think we took it as a, a fait accompli uh, in Lebanon. Aaron, did you want to I mean, I, again, you know, form follows function. So what's the point? What are the advantages and what are the disadvantages? I don't know if there's statutory implications, uh, congressional implications of how his ball's participation in a, in a Lebanese government would affect American assistance. Yeah, it, it, yeah. I mean, there are no assistance. I, I can, yes. Yeah. There you go. So, so, right. so on that, I can actually because yeah, we, right. we came up against this when in, when Hamas got a majority in the Palestinian parliament, and the question there, according to the lawyers at the State Department, was if this is a parliamentary system, then this thing called the Palestinian Authority is now. <coughs> A subsidiary of a terrorist group, and therefore you can't not only not give money, you can't talk to them. And we um, carved out exceptions to that. For example, well, no, the office of the, the president is separately elected, and he and his office is not subsidiary to the subordinate to the um, parliament, um, and so forth. In the case of Lebanon, if they had an election in which Hezbollah got 51% of the seats in parliament, uh, we, our aid would just stop. We would stop. We, it, it's very clear. And um, not as a policy question. I mean, that no, would be the good. lawyers at L would tell you, you're done. The anti-terrorism legislation is street, very tightly prescribed. So it has obvious consequences. Um, are there any other questions? I wanted to, uh, our colleagues have been very generous with their time. and. Aaron, in particular, who traveled from cool Portland, Maine, or wish, actually I northern cool, Maine. I, wish. Uh, so I want to thank you both very much. It was, uh, uh, just as I had hoped, a very interesting and thoughtful conversation. So thank you very, very much.